All right, everybody. We've had a uh, slight change in plans. Uh, I randomly got a call from a dear friend, and I, quite frankly, I was quite uh, shocked and surprised and happy to hear from you today, Ross. Uh, we were in town uh, teaching for uh, another a local practice here, or their yeah. group practice, and uh, Shaw Pease and my associate and I came, and we got through a little early, so uh, Shaw drove me through the city because yeah. he knew where your practice was. And I said, oh, wow. So I gave you a call. Right <laughs> well, there. I appreciate that. Yeah. So um, I'm sitting here with Dr. Ross Nash, who's here visiting Raleigh, uh, trying to help other practices compete with me. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> but good for you. Good for them, by the way, yeah. uh, for being smart enough to bring somebody like you in. And, Thank you. Uh, for those of, of the listeners that don't know, Ross is a giant in dentistry. Uh, you know, you're not a giant in stature necessarily, you know. No, sure. You know, well, I'm not even short. I'm just saying you're not, you know, you're not big like me, you know. So uh, that's good for you. And um, But you're in Charlotte, North Carolina. You've been there since the, probably the 80s now? Yes. I opened my practice there in 1980. And so in the 80s. And uh, you also run the Nash Institute. Yes, sir. Uh, and so, you know, listen, I want to tell our listeners my story with Ross. Uh, so I think it was um, 1999, I believe. I had just gotten out of school. You were doing <laughs> the program. I still don't know how to say it. Aesthetic epitome. Epitome is what aesthetic I called epitome. it. Epitome. The, the aesthetic epitome slash epitome. And it was a, a multi-day class that you had in, in, in Charlotte. Uh, at the time in your uh, office building in South Park, yep. it's actually attached to your practice. And um, so I went down there. Uh, it was on direct composites, indirect restorations, porcelain veneers. It was, it was my first exposure to the type of dentistry that I ended up wanting to do. And um, it was my first exposure to real CE. And for me, it was lucky. I mean, I, I look back and, and I mean this very sincerely. Um, I look back that I was lucky that I took your class Thank you. because I could have taken anybody's class. Right. But you really showed me what dentistry could be. And uh, to me, that was so important. And then one thing led to another. And I really kind of remember me finagling my way in. No, we ask you to be a mentor. Well, that's nice of you to say, Ross. But yeah. I remember just kind of showing up and you guys probably like, what in the world does this guy keep doing here? And um, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to be a part of it. You know, you guys were doing great things. Uh, you were a gracious educator, a phenomenal clinician, um, a legitimately ph phenomenal clinician. And uh, Deborah was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, great business business-minded lady uh, with a, a real grasp of how to communicate with patients and build team. And so I just wanted to be part of it. And uh, so I was happy to pay my way down there. I was happy to pay to be down there, um, you know, and I was early in my career, so I had plenty of time. Um, but I will tell you this, and I, and I mean this unbelievably sincerely, what I learned from you as a dentist was unbelievably important. But what I learned from my experience there as a mentor was immensely important in me developing my career as a speaker and educator. Um, some of the things that I learned uh, from you was how to be a phenomenal clinician, how to connect with people, how to be down to earth, how to be, you know, and I say this in a nice way, how to be simple. You know, we're doing complex work. So quite frankly, that maybe five or ten percent, fifteen percent of the dentists really do. But but what I saw from you was a way to not look complicated, and a way to make it, you know, inspiring and achievable. Uh, and and somebody that was that made me feel like, hey, if he can do it, I can do it. And uh, you know, that those are some of the things I learned. Thank you. And that's um, very nice of you to say. And uh, you know, my drive for excellence, how to work. The importance of working with manufacturers and trying to develop your career and trying to help spread your message. Yeah. Um, you know, some of these things aren't as important in today's world, uh, but certainly in 1999 and 2000, uh, they were unbelievably important. Thank so, you. Um, well, it's nice to know. And um, I've always been uh, fond of you in that Thank way, you. so I appreciate it. So, well, you have uh, obviously jumped way far past that, T Bone. Uh, I would like uh, to I knew think him so. Before yeah. it was T Bone. Yeah. yeah, it was it was Tarun. Yes, but yeah. uh, you've done. I'm really proud of what Thank you've you. done, and Thank to help you. your peers. 
Well, isn't that what we do this for? It's not. Yeah. I mean, many people think we do it for the money, and the truth is, is it's it's we're better not, not we're better off of in our practice. Yeah, not a lot of money. Yeah, in we're, it, we're really better off in our yeah, practice. Yeah, you uh, have to have the passion for it. But uh, and I love it. I you know what I what I love is when I see our students be more successful mm-hmm. than us. Me too. And um, that that is you know it's like a parent in a way. You know, every parent wants their kids to do better than them. Yeah. And and that's really how I look at um, educating. Good so, for you, my friend. So what's our, what's your story, Ross? I mean, for, for our listeners that don't know who Ross Nash is or don't quite understand who Ross Nash is, talk to us about it. Thank you. I, let me give you a nutshell. Okay. It, it goes back. Now, well, we, I, yeah, we don't need the 19, 19, 1890s story. Okay? No, I'm not going back, but I do need <laughs> you to know the basis of where I came right. from. Uh, I graduated from North Carolina State University in 1970 with a degree in textile engineering. And I went to work in the engineering field for, in textiles. I worked for DuPont as a process engineer in a nylon yarn manufacturing plant in Martinsville, Virginia, for a couple of years. Those so jobs I, are in China now. Oh yeah, I know. That changed. <laughs> Everything's changed. Uh, but I learned a lot about resins because mm-hmm. nylon's a resin. So that helped me, I believe, later when I decided to become a dentist. A couple of years there, and then I was offered a job in Charlotte, my hometown, um, with Seba Geige Chemical Company, and they make dyes and chemicals and pharmaceuticals. Well, they, I was in the dyes and chemicals for textile fibers division, and I was a dye colorist or a chemist. Mm-hmm. And it was my job with Siva Geige to make dyes that gave certain colors on certain fabrics for the customer. So I learned a lot about color, hue, value, chroma, all those kind of things. So it was interesting that those two parts of my background ultimately helped me in dentistry. But I wanted what dentists had, you know, I mm-hmm. wanted to be able to affect people and affect people's lives every day on a one-to-one basis and that's what dentistry is and your own boss yeah and that too be mm-hmm. my own my own boss i was in a corporate world and i liked the idea so i applied to dental school and i was lucky enough to get in at chapel hill and at the age of 27 almost 28 i went back to school graduated nearly 31 years old I uh, went out and I was an associate for a couple of years in Eden, North Carolina, and then I started my practice. In Eden Charlotte. is on the on the coast. Yeah, well, no, it's north. It's north. near Virginia. Okay, near Virginia. It's okay. a, a, an associateship position to get get me started. But then I I opened my own practice in my home, Charlotte, North mm-hmm. Carolina, in 1980. And in just a few short years there, I was I had a nice little general practice going. I was placing amalgams and doing some crowns and some restorative and some partials and dentures and pre- preventive, you know, good old mm-hmm. bread and butter general dentistry. I was having a great time, but something happened in dentistry that time in our, in our dental uh, history that changed the face of dentistry. Light cured composites came on the scene. Tooth colored composites and light, no light cured because we had light acrylics. Cured. We had, yeah. we had chemically cured materials light. when I was in dental school, a couple of them concise yeah. and adaptive, and you could do a few things with them okay. like a class three or maybe a class four anterior with a couple of pins to hold okay. it in. That was about it. Now we had these unbelievable materials beyond gold and silver and porcelain infused to metal. We had aesthetic materials that could also restore the tooth and you could adhesively bond them to the tooth. And they had colors that would blend in, dentin enamel and sizal mm-hmm. shades as time went on. And, and you could command cure these and, and we found you could indeed bond to dentin. It was such an exciting time in dentistry back in the early 80s and I was right in the middle of it so because of my background I understood these things a little bit more maybe than the average dentist and I started taking courses from the gurus Mm -hmm. the the, the pioneers like Norman Feigenbaum, Buddy Mopper, Mm -hmm. Ron Goldstein, Paul Belvedere, Erwin Smigel some of these people have passed away but they were out there doing these things with composite that nobody ever did and most of the courses, the hands-on courses, were given to my manufacturers because the dental schools weren't even teaching it yet. Right. So I would go out and take these courses, and I would come home, and I would do these procedures. And I have to tell you, it changed my life. You loved I, them, didn't you? I loved them. I love being a dentist. I still do. I like being a doctor, and it's my responsibility to help people with their function and health. That's, that's my responsibility as a doctor. But I could all, all, not only be a doctor, I could be someone who helped people with their self-esteem. Someone would come in with black decay on their front tooth or a broken front tooth, something that would really bother them aesthetically. And in one single appointment, I could change that tooth to look like not a tooth color filling, a natural tooth. And I would get tears of joy and and hugs and kisses and And people wanted to visit letters of uh, thank you and bottles of wine and referrals. And you mean you didn't get that with your amalgams? No. (laughs) 
<laughs> but what I liked about it was not only the thing I did for their health, but I, what I did for people's self-esteem. And it made me happy. And that's what I, I said, this is it. This is what I'm going to do with my career. I want to focus on aesthetics. What can I do that will give the patient the health and function I'm responsible for as a doctor and the aesthetics they're looking for as an artist? It comes down to composites and ceramics. Right. We found out later you could actually bond ceramics to the two, yeah. and that changed everything again. So I was right at the beginning, and I started focusing my practice on aesthetics early in my career. I was the local bondodontist. Mm. When and it that, wasn't good to be a bondodontist. Exactly. You know yeah. how dentistry is. Very slow yeah. to change, conservative Kind of like people that did marketing in the 90s. <laughs> exactly. I was looked upon as, you know, the guy. You be careful about this guy. But over the years, I gained respect for my right. profession, and that's important to me. I, that's I, important to me too. I want to be liked, you know, and uh, but I stuck to my guns. I mean, I had a few people not liking what I was doing, but over the years, I built a practice in Charlotte that was known for aesthetics, on purpose. I let people know that I could do it. I if I found someone that that needed a smile makeover and they were in the public eye, I try to do it, even if I did it for nothing, mm -hmm. to get my name out there, to let people know this is what I, I'm doing, and. That's what happened over a period of years. And that's why uh, I'm probably, our practice, uh, Cosmetic Dentistry of the Carolinas, which is in Huntersville, North Carolina, right outside of Charlotte on Lake Norman, uh, is known as one of the best or one of the top cosmetic practices. But that was by design. I got right. plenty of competition. So not luck? No. No. No, it was by design. How Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I've got plenty of competition. Right. Lots of good dentists. Great dentists. dentists, yeah. But I've got 41 years of experience. And that makes a big difference. As long so, as you tell people about it. Although you let people know. Oh, yeah. yeah. Or yeah. other people tell people for you. I, I'm so excited about it. They catch it from me. Yeah. And uh, it, it's just a passion I've got. And I believe I don't make any more money than any other successful dentist. Mm -hmm. But I believe that if you're passionate about what you do, you'll do it longer. I'm almost 72. And I'm still doing it. I don't plan to stop. And you'll make more money doing what you love doing yeah. well you'll at least enjoy it even if you don't yeah. so you, that's my law i'm sorry yeah. about the link no, no, that's a, my history how'd you get into education i mean that's a that's another thing uh, in ninth in the early 1980s kerr manufacturing was looking for somebody to talk about their product they came up with the first hybrid composite still on the market mm -hmm. don't even advertise it and it's still sold herculite <laughs> and uh before that we had macrofills and microfills and so they were looking for somebody to talk about it. Well, I had the engineering background they liked, and I talked to some of their people, and I was out in the seminars, and they asked me if I'd be interested in talking about it, and that's how I got my seminar career started. I didn't, had never spoken in front of a crowd, ever. But I was very comfortable talking about something I was this passionate about to one person or 500 people. And uh, that's how my seminar career, I would go out and do programs to teach people how to use their composite, like right. the other companies were doing. Somebody would ask me to come to their local dental society or their study club or the state society and then the national. And the One thing led to another. Yeah, and that's how my career was built. I think you left out something very important, Ross. I think it all started for you on the education side because you documented your work. Yeah, no question. Because you, you got to be able to show people what you're doing. And, mm -hmm. and uh, from, from what I remember of you, and I know that to be true today, is that you didn't document your work just before and after you documented step by step yeah. what you were doing, how you're doing it. And this was back when we, you probably had one of those things called slides. Slides. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, little celluloid things with pictures on. And so you'd have to make these little carousels. Hey, those and, cost a dollar a piece. I know. And I had 200,000 of them over 20 years. 200,000 slides. I spent $200,000 on slides. But best documentation you had, now they're free. No, the digital cameras, yeah. Yeah, once we went to digital, I took two million. Yeah. And they're all, you know, they're free. You just have to have more hard drive space. So I've got even more. But you're right. Document, document, document. And someone told me at the National Speakers Association, I went one year and joined, that if you would write articles for your local, I mean, for your, for your dental publications, right. and they're always looking for articles, uh, then you would be asked to speak. You would be known. And I started writing articles. Yeah. So it all came down to, I love doing dentistry. I still do it. And I love to teach just like you. Yeah. 
And, you know, it's amazing. Today, that's Instagram photos and Facebook photos yeah. and dental town photos. But there's still a place for the reputation you get from being in, in the journals. Yes. But certainly the uh, well thought of journals. And uh, I would always tell anybody that, uh, it, and it's true for me too. Uh, for me, my story was uh, taking photographs and sharing it on the social media at the time, which was dental town. And, and again, same thing. Show it. Manufacturers, hey, do you mind coming and showing other people how to do it? We need a speaker for this. Dental society right. here, dental society share. there, and you share, and you share, it, it's you share with, uh, I want to say with impunity, you share with uh, a love for helping people. You didn't share with an ask every single time, you know. Certainly, you ask. There's a time where you have to run a business and ask, uh, but you shared with yeah. with helping people. There's also one key thing in my history that uh, helped make my career yeah. and my life. To be honest with you, I met Deborah Engelhart. Right. Deborah was a practice management consultant uh, on her own at Deborah Englehart and Associates Man, uh, Consulting in Seattle, Washington. Uh, gosh, it was back in 19, let's see. You better know. Uh, 1990, <laughs> 1990, I went to the ADA meeting in Seattle, and, and uh, she was on the program. And I just fell madly in love with her. I was going through a divorce. I hadn't mm -hmm. finished it yet, but I was planning to finish it. And... Uh, I I, met, I saw her, met her, got to talk to her. She had no idea, by the way. And I just fell mad in love with her. Didn't forget about her. I went home, didn't didn't see her for a year. Went to the ADA meeting in, in uh, Orlando the next year. I went to a cocktail party and I had a couple of drinks. I'll admit it. <laughs> went to a cocktail party. There she was in this blue dress and just knocked me off my feet. And I went to her, and I had, like I said, I had a couple of drinks. I was loose, and I said, hey, I've been thinking about you all year. Turned out she felt the same way, and she bought that blue dress, hoping she'd run into me. Good that was kind guys. of neat. So four years later, she married me and moved to Charlotte, uh, 1995. Started uh, pr managing my practice. First year, I doubled my net income. That tells you how important the business and right. industry is. I don't like the business. You want I mean, to be a clinician. You got to have it. You can't yeah. deliver a service without having a successful business. But I like the service. Yeah. She handles the business. So together we started the Nash Institute. That's yeah, uh, and like still running today. Running today. Focusing on cosmetic dentistry. Yep. Anterior aesthetics, posterior we, aesthetics. We have three courses. Now talk to me about those. Okay, we we have uh, a curriculum of three courses, which are a continuum: direct composites, mm -hmm. indirect restorations, and full mouth rehabilitation those three courses two days both of them friday and saturday hands-on half hands-on they're agd pace approved so that's our continuum three individual courses you can take independently you don't have to take them all three but to, as a uh, group of courses they are a continuum we do that five times a year that's 15 courses mm -hmm. i teach at the institute my wife teaches four courses on on uh, uh the practice success uh she calls it dental business school and she has mm -hmm. teams in there. So we're, we're in operation, you know, 19 weekends a month. And then we also both speak on the road. So that's our, it's that's our life. life. It is. And, and, uh, I, I practice three days a week. I'll be 72 in September. I don't plan to stop. I, I practice what my passion is and I teach what my passion is. And it's just keeps me going. It's not even work anymore. Is it? No. No. The reason I can work three days is because I found the ideal associate. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, and that's been important to me. So t tell me, Ross, um, what are the important things? Let's say you were talking to your associate, okay, or you're talking to a young dentist or something. And what would you say are the important things that's really shaped your career? Uh, finding the one thing. Okay. My passion. I don't believe you can be good at all. Now, don't get me wrong. There's all kinds of things you can do in dentistry. Yeah. You're an expert in implants and right. 3D dentistry. Uh, I tried to be an expert in aesthetic dentistry. A lot of dentists try to do it all. Endo, perio. It's okay. You can do it in general practice and you can do it well. But I believe if you find the one thing that really drives you, and mine was aesthetics, you're going to be more successful. So I would say find the part of dentistry you love and focus on it. You don't have to be good at everything, but be good at something. Okay. So, okay, so great. I have a passion for cosmetics, okay? 
you've met an associate who also has a passion for cosmetics, but I'm not Ross. You know, I, I, I don't have 41 years of experience. Let's turn back the time and, and how did you build a practice that's essentially focused on cosmetics mm -hmm. and has a tracted reputation that brings in pretty well-known people? Yeah, how do you build that? On purpose. Okay, so talk to me about it. What do you mean by on purpose? I had the goal. I wanted to be the best in my field, one of the best in mm -hmm. my field. Whatever that field was, I chose cosmetics because I loved it, and I worked towards that goal. I made sure that when I did a good cosmetic case that other people knew about it. Now, how would you let them know about it? I photograph everything I do. Okay. I, of course, I get permission from my patients. Uh, I, I put together a, a photo album. Of course, you can do it online now. Yeah. And uh, I can show people cases much like theirs. I built a portfolio of my own, not just pictures of other people that have done it in other books, Ron Goldstein's Change Your Smile, all those things are out there. But I built my own portfolio of before and after pictures. And I can find something in there that's very close yeah, to I what everybody's done. If I walk in with a diastema done. between eight and nine and yeah. I have tetracycline standing, you can probably recall I've a patient a, that's literally almost exactly I've like got that. a half a dozen cases just like that I've done. And when they can see that I've done it yeah. for somebody else just like them, it becomes it, real. it's powerful. Yeah. So that's why my associate, when he, when he came with me a year and a half ago, I encouraged him to start building his own portfolio, take lots of pictures, and he does. He's become a tremendous photographer. You know, I tell um, it's funny you talk about that. I, I still, to this day, like my speaking career started on dental photography. And um, yes. I would tell you my practice was built on dental photography. I mean, listen, I was 23 years old when I graduated dental school. And I was, was 20, young. You know, I was 20, I was 23 essentially when I opened my practice, 20, I barely turned 24 when I opened my practice, you know, and I didn't look old like I do now. I looked young and I was much thinner and had hair, but it was hard to get people to accept five, 10, $15,000 yeah. worth of work when you're 24 years old it is. and, and what was important to me and, and we weren't quite digital at the time. I used to go get one hour prints done. So while the patient would come in, we'd take their photographs, we'd do their cleaning, all that stuff. We'd have the one-hour prints done across the street, and we'd come back and show them the photographs literally in prints. And it was so important to help us sell dentistry. That's interesting because that's exactly what I do, David. I do it digitally. Yeah. When a patient comes in for a consult, we take, and I ask, may I take some photographs? Yes. Yeah. Take a full face, smile, both sides, mm -hmm. retracted, frontal, both sides. Biting, both the clues will be used. Right. Put them in the computer, put them right up on the screen in front of them. Before we start talking, we're looking at those pictures together. And your patient starts pointing out things. And they expand their own treatment plans. Yeah. That's my teeth. I yeah. say, yeah, you have really good structure here. Lots of good things to work with. I encourage them. Yeah. Uh, unless you got to give them hope. Unless there's not. Right. Yeah. And then uh, they, uh, maybe they come in because they're interested in something about their two front teeth. And now they're saying, well, what about those teeth beside it? Expand their own treatment plans. So pictures, very important for communication. Yeah, you know, uh, it's so important to me. Like, I, I don't know how your practice runs. We don't have intraoral cameras in our practice. Uh, I don't see a need for them. You uh, do, you do. Uh, we ex yeah, extra oral. Yeah. Yeah, we do. You know, we do DSLR extra oral cameras. And quite frankly, we have one in every operatory. That's how important yes. photography is for me. That everybody in our office, a condition of employment, is that you learn how to take excellent photographs based on your position, right? You know, and that's super important. All right. So, what would be the one thing uh, that you would tell somebody um, that's young that wanted to say, "I want to be the next Ross Nash"? What would you tell them? Find your one thing. Yeah. What you're passionate about. It may not be cosmetic dentistry. It may be implants. Uh, it may be gold foil. I don't know if you remember what that is. <laughs> but find the one thing that gives you reward and focus on being the best you can at that. You don't have to be good at everything. You have to have the I – ha, I have a dream team out at Lake Norman, North right. Carolina. i got the periodontist, the oral surgeon, the endodontist, the orthodontist. I've got my dream team that can put anything together that I want, and we FaceTime with our patients. But I'm good at – defining the aesthetics and completing it. That's my passion. Find your passion and get really good at it. So that involves taking education? Oh, yeah. Whether that's YouTube, 
obviously we prefer in person yeah. uh, because, you know, I, I keep telling people there's nothing wrong with YouTube, Instagram, Facebook no. education. No. It's good. It's a great foundation. And you can learn a lot, quite frankly. But what you can't learn on YouTube or the computer is interaction, communication. Yeah. You can't learn. Uh, you can't feel passion through a computer screen. You can't, you can't meet somebody. You can't yeah. talk to them. I mean, think about how many of your best friends in dentistry today are people that you met at education courses that you took? Uh, many. Almost all, right? Yes. You know, and, and you guys lifted each other. Yeah. You know, you kind of brought each other up and, and part of that's part of it's that competitive gene. Like I know you're good friends with Larry Rosenthal yeah. and that there's a competitive gene as much as yes, we, we respect what Larry's done, but this part of it's like, I can do what he does, Yeah. you know, and, and he's doing this well, next time you see him, Hey, how are you doing that? And then, and then you're like, okay, yeah. I want to go back and try that in my office and vice versa as well, you know, and um, yeah, you've got to be, I, I don't, this is no secret in dentistry. You got to be a continual student because it's changing so fast now more than ever. That's why I have my millennial with yeah. me just to do your Instagram posting for you. No, more than that. <laughs> I know. I mean, second nature is, is the technology to them. Okay. So, um, you brought up millennial and yeah. associate. Um, you know, you know, spring chicken. I don't mean that with disrespect. Oh. Oh. I mean, you met 72, you know, it's no spring chicken. Yeah. Um, so you have to bring in an associate because there has to be some, some way of transitioning, some way of mentoring. So let's talk about that a little bit. Talk the, to me about the reason really that, that I got an associate, uh, was because, um, I was doing all the work. I mean, I had one man practice. It was me. Doing well, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but it was all me. And when you're focusing on these big cases, it's hard to even get up and check hygiene. You can't. You can't. You've got to. You've got to focus, or you're going to make mistakes. And that's when you do them over. Right. So you need to focus. And I had a nice little general practice, not as big as some of these out here, mm -hmm. because I do a lot of aesthetic work and with patients that come in just for that and then go somewhere else. But I have a nice general practice. You got to take care of those people. And uh, I found myself being rushed on big cases, and that doesn't feel good. So what my associate has been able to do for me is let me cut back to three days a week. Remember, 72 years old mm -hmm. in September. Uh, your back will feel it. One day makes a big difference. My back feels it at 43, man. There you go. But uh, it, one day has made a big difference for me. So I work three days a week on patients. He takes care of the four days in the general practice plus – he does some pretty darn good aesthetic work to himself. Well, he's uh, going to have to. He's in your practice. Well, that's the nice thing about it. He gets exposure to the types of patients that want that high-quality dentistry. So he's had the opportunity to do some of it that others might not have. Uh, but that's it's been really good for me. Um, we, we've we been together a year and a half. Uh, practice is doing better than it was before he came. Uh, my back feels better. Mm -hmm. I can focus. And uh, it's just been a very, very good thing for us. As far as our, our future goes, it's up in the air. We're, yeah. we're open. You know, it's, it's interesting you talk about focus. And um, I had this, I want to say argument. I had this rant with my team maybe a couple of months ago. And I said to them, I said, listen, I was talking to one of my hygienists who I have a great relationship with. We give each other a little bit of stuff every once in a while, you know. Um, I said to her, I said, listen, at the end of the day, you're pretty much doing hygiene day in and day out. You know, that's what you do. Every one of your patients is essentially pretty much the same. Yeah, they got different little differences here and there. But I said, what happens is sometimes I'm asked to do two hygiene checks. So I, I'm in my room doing my larger work or even what, I, what I, even if it's a quadrant of fillings. I mean, that, that's mentally draining to me, to be quite frank with you. You have to focus. Yeah, you got to focus, right? And then I got to get up and I got to reset my mind to go do a new patient exam. And then I got to reset my mind to go do a recall on a patient who's been with me for 15 years. And then I got to reset my mind to go back and do whatever it is I was doing. And then I got to, when that patient said, I got to reset my mind to go do a consult for somebody who's here to get something fancy done to them. You know, and, and it's not the physical part for me that, that, that drives me nuts. It's the mental yeah. of having to switch your mind over and over and over again. Yeah. And the truth is, is I think that's what holds so many people back from developing practice that they want is that they're, that they're mentally not focused. And so one of the things I tell a lot of people and is I say, 
when you're going down that path of starting an aesthetics practice like Ross Nash, you got to pick a day, a week that you make your ideal day that you go in and you say, and I, I tell people it should be your day off, you know, be committed to it that on your day off once a week, once a month, whatever it is in the beginning that you committed so that you can go in there and do your absolute best work and that you could document that work because it's hard to document work when you're running around checking two hygienists it is. And, and, and documentation. As I, and I get this, I don't know if you get this. I get people that say, well, I'm not trying to be an instructor or a teacher. I don't need to document my work. And I, and I totally disagree with yeah. them. You may not need to take 20 pictures, but you, you darn need to take five or six pictures of every yeah. case you do because that's how you sell your dentistry. Well, that's it's, how you it's get more better. Than, it's more than that. There is no better documentation than photography. Let's say you had some kind of a legal problem. Right. If you got a picture of it, you're in a lot better shape. Yeah. And it, it just helps you grow. You've got to document, it makes document, you better. document, document. No you if you're a conscientious it. dentist that wants to be better, in fact, I tell dental students that I meet, I say, you want to get the job that you dream of? Walk into an interview with a portfolio of dentistry. And it may, may be amalgams, okay? It may be hand-rotated endo. But when you walk in with a portfolio of your work, it speaks volumes for the type of person that you are. Yeah. And um, so it's super important.